And now I want to introduce um, uh, our precision medicine star here at Stanford, Dr. Michael Snyder. Mike is my postdoctoral advisor, and he's one of the most open-minded researchers I've ever met, um, which is reflected in the fact that he um, is, you know, he started over 18 companies worth over six and a half billion dollars to unicorns. Like, not only does he innovate within academia, he actually spins out these companies to help people, which is really unique and special and, you know, for me, exciting. And he's also one of the biggest pioneers in the world in precision medicine and a field called multi-omics that he will explain to you. And I believe that these kinds of tools have the promise to actually create objective and causal routes in mental health care. So here's Mike. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Ariel. It really is a pleasure to welcome everyone here. I think it's going to be an exciting day, and I'm all wired, um, so I can't wait to hear what everyone has to say. Um, I do believe we've hit a whole new era in health and medicine. Uh, the, what we do today is so different from what we did 10 years ago, and, and what we're capable of doing is way even better. Uh, and just to put this in framework, um, I think you know you can collect all kinds of data now. You can sequence people's genomes, measure tens of thousands of molecules out of their blood and urine, measure exposomes, physiomes, uh, all these different data collections, uh, which are, we think are going to be very, very powerful for tracking health. And that's thanks to the revolution in genome sequencing, mass spectrometry, and other proteomics that let you follow these molecules, and the wearable technologies, which will show up several times today. On top of this, we have a whole revolution going on in computer science and being able to handle large amounts of data and whole new ways of analyzing data. Unless you've been under a rock, you uh, should know that there's tons going on in the area of machine learning, deep learning, and especially these days, generative AI, for being able to take information to synthesize it. And what this has led to is that we have machines that can outperform humans by a lot. You may have heard a few years ago that Google could tell the sex of a person from their eye. Humans could never do that, 50-50 if you ask uh, sex, uh, you take an image of an eye, but yet a machine can do it 99% accuracy. Um, these days, these are just a, a slide I stole from Eric Topol. These are all the diagnostics you can do just from an eye. Okay, they're not yet in the clinic, but we're in a world where you can take information that uh, should be able to transform what we can do for physical health. You can see the various things listed here retinopathies, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all from an image from an eye, heart uh, failure. It's pretty amazing. Cancer, which should be using this, uh, you can do diagnostics off images using AI programs. This is some work from Kun Sin, who's in our lab and then continued in his own at Harvard, where you take images and you can actually predict people. You can do diagnostics, you can do prognostics, and you can do subtyping all from images that, the, in, you know, five years ago, all you'd say is cancer or not. And it was all read by pathologists. It's still mostly read by pathologists. It should be read by computers, but um, this is where we're going. Uh, speaking for our own work, many of you know, we do deep data tracking of people to try and follow people longitudinally, see what their wellness profile looks like, and try and find deviations from that. And, and we started this with a pilot of 109 people, and just in the first few years, half learned something pretty important about their health, all pre-symptomatically. Again, these deep data dyes gave a clear picture of health that we could track and then catch disease early before it was symptomatic. Uh, we've take, extended this further to actually analyze genomes using AI. We can find 10 to 100 times more genes by doing deep data dives with these new methods. Uh, and just one example, the middle ALS, which is known to be highly heritable, about 61%. Seven genes were known. With these new AI methods, we found 700 genes, six times more heritability. So these new methods can really revolutionize what we're trying to do with, with human health. We're also, many of you know, doing a lot with wearables. You'll hear about some of that today. I'm a big fan of these. You see all my smartwatches, my rings, my hearing aid is also a, a wearable as well. Um, and of course, I have my glucose monitor on me. Um, and these are powerful, and then I'll talk about microsampling in a minute. But these are powerful, we think, for disease detection, tracking health, because they're following you 24-7. And we showed early on, you could tell when people are getting infectious illness, initially with Lyme disease, later with respiratory viral infections, all from a simple smartwatch. 
and a pulse ox. And we've gone on to set up COVID detection methods actually with this now when the pandemic broke out. That's actually our first case on the left, uh, individual whose heart rate jumped up nine and a half days before they had symptoms. Next day they were diagnosed. Uh, and we've set up real-time detection methods and now I'll make a shameless plug. I'd love all of you to join our study so we can make these algorithms better. They work about 80% of the time, but we want to get them up to 100%. I know we can do better. We're, we're limited on data, actually. Um, and so you can see the one on the, on the right. Um, the, that's, an in, that's a real-time detection system where you still have to click on it. Hopefully soon we'll send you a red alert without clicking. But uh, that's an individual who got a red alert. Uh, we're just getting red alerts three days prior to symptom onset. So this works, same number, about 80% of the time. It even works on asymptomatic cases, works for Apple, works for Fitbit. Uh, so up at the top, that's an individual who uh, was asymptomatic, but they got diagnosed uh, where that arrow is, and they were getting red alerts for th two weeks prior to that. So these are very, very sensitive um, device, this is a simple consumer grade device, right, that can actually detect disease. It's pretty amazing when you think about where we can go. And I won't have time to get in this, but we think they're more sensitive than antigen assays that you're currently using. Probably about a day more sensitive, at least in some cases that's true. Okay, I, I should emphasize this is why we need more data. They're not specific for COVID and infectious disease. They, uh, actually, I, interestingly, these devices can pick up workplace stress as the number one trigger of red alerts. So you can pick up mental stress from these devices. We just don't have them tuned right for this, and this is something you'll probably hear about from Ziv and others. But we should be able to do this stuff much more efficiently than we're doing. Uh, again, this tip of the iceberg with machine learning, just look, collecting information from a smartwatch. This is a 2016 smartwatch. We can pick up things around red blood cell count, hemoglobin. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Your watch is actually shining light uh, into your blood and looks for spectro spectroscopic shifts and can actually de detect what's going on with your red blood cell counts. You can also pick up hemoglobin A1C, uh, fasting glucose levels as well. You, these devices with the right computer science behind them can actually collect lots of information we think will be very, very powerful. Glucose monitoring, many of you know, we're all very personalized in how we respond to food, so we all reacted differently to that breakfast out there. Uh, on the right just shows that this work from Aaron Siegel, that the person at the top spikes a banana but not a cookie, the one at the bottom spikes a cookie but not a banana. Um, so we all, again, respond differently to different foods. We've taken this another step further. Uh, many of you know we're, we're keen on doing remote monitoring, which I think will be very, very powerful for mental health because a lot of folks, once they're in various states, they really don't want to visit a physician or see someone. But to be able to collect samples at home, we think would be very, very powerful. And so uh, we set up this, uh, we spent actually now close to seven years working on this methods for collecting samples that you can mail in and then we'll measure thousands of analytes. And I know what that sounds like, but ours actually works. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we'll measure proteins, metabolites, lipids, and actually high-value molecules. And just to show you, and this is a big deal, we think, in the mental health space, uh, we can get very personalized responses that we measure. So we had 32 people drink that shake and then measure them before, and then 30, 60, 120, 240 minutes afterwards. Hundreds of molecules change, including key molecules like insulin, uh, something called incretin. These are important growth or important um, glucose response hormones, even inflammatory markers, we can measure from these tiny drops of blood. And what we discovered is that everybody responds differently to that same shake. Again, so same shake, we're all responding differently. At the top uh, is the response to carbohydrates, three carbohydrates. Each box is a different person. Uh, and let's see here, I don't really have a pointer. Let's see if I can point to, see the one that boxes down that individual's carbs plummet after they drink the shake. You move over three, that person's carbs skyrocket after drinking the shake. Uh, same thing, next few over, they all go up. A little bit further over, that person's goes down, so on and so forth. So same shake, people responding to it very differently. And it's probably hard to see at the bottom, but that we group people into five categories. The one on the right, the gray is the average, and that really should have a pointer here. Okay, well anyway, um, imagine the one on the right, <laughs> there's a brown spot that's way below the gray one. 
those individuals, their inflammatory markers drop after drinking that shake. The next category over, their inflammatory markers go up. All right, thanks. There we go. So on the, you can see that on the right side anyway. So that's the inflammatory markers down relative to the group. This group of people, inflammatory markers go up. Same shake, pro-inflammatory on some, anti-inflammatory on others. We're all different. Okay, we can measure that though, so we can at least see how we're different. We don't know why they're different. Same is true over here, this person's inflammatory markers, that group goes up as well. So we think this is powerful and this is the kind of thing we need for the mental health field. This is where I'd like to see all of this go. This is one individual who sampled himself every hour for a waking hour for seven straight days uh, while wearing a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, smartwatch, doing food logging. Thousands of molecules change, so 98 samples collected. Thousands of molecules change, and you can do associations, time-like correlations. And the idea is upstream events might be causative of downstream events. We can measure this. We find thousands of associations between people's activity, their, their physiology, like heart rate, glucose levels, steps, and actually their biochemical responses. And some of the cool results are, here's a simple one. The, your insulin C peptide, and this person goes up 10 minutes after their glucose, not a surprise, but we can quantify it, which is nice in that exact person. We find new inflammatory markers that go up in response to glucose, probably explains why glucose causes inflammation. And here's a cool one for this crowd, alpha-synuclein, which is involved in dementia and Parkinson's. It actually has a very interesting pattern. We think it's tracking with stress and certain kinds of stress. So imagine you're at risk for this. Perhaps you want to know that so you can mitigate that. And maybe I'm not saying you'd stop getting dementia, but maybe you'll push it off for a few years, just like we try and do for diabetes and glucose monitors. So this is the world we, can, we live in now with physiology, being able to measure people's you know, physical health. Where are we with mental health? Oh, we have dashboards for all this. In mental health, you just heard from Ariel, we're in the stone ages, in my opinion. We don't have good biomarkers for this. We don't have good therapies that work consistently because we're all different. We need to subtype the disease. We need these conditions, I should say, and we need to actually treat them at the individual level. And I think we're gonna hear a lot about that at today's meeting. And so try and get you all pumped up to learn all kinds of cool stuff. I know I'm hoping to learn a lot. And so those are some of my opening remarks and great to have everyone here.